A new CCP virus outbreak hits China. A man tests positive after three weeks in quarantine and testing negative nine times. A super typhoon is heading to South China. It's losing strength along the way, but coastal areas are still bracing themselves. Beijing's World Robot Conference featured a Chinese-speaking Albert Einstein, backflipping dogs and AI nurses. But controversy is stirring despite the grand displays. Investors who back China's second largest property developer are demanding their money back. Nearly 300 real estate companies reportedly filed for bankruptcy already this year. If their company joins the list, it could send shockwaves through China's economy. And a Wall Street Journal investigation accuses TikTok of allegedly promoting sexual content to minors. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Some returning travelers have to do three weeks of quarantine in China. But is it enough? Chinese officials reported a new virus case on Saturday from a man who spent 21 days in quarantine. He tested negative nine times, yet still reportedly brought the virus into the country. That's in southeast China's Fujian province, where a new outbreak of the CCP virus struck. Local officials reported at least 75 cases in the past three days. The first cases were students from a local elementary school. But experts pointed to one of the students' parents, a father who recently returned from Singapore. He's believed to be the likely source of the outbreak. He was tested nine times in quarantine and each time came back negative until he tested positive on Friday. That's 37 days after he entered China, according to state-run media Global Times. How could this happen? Experts can't explain how the virus could remain hidden for so long. Or did he get infected in China? No one knows. Now local officials are telling the public not to leave the area. They have suspended bus and train services, closed cinemas and bars and other facilities, and they've ramped up mass testing. The case is coming on the heels of another Delta-driven outbreak. It spread to more than half of China's provinces in July after emerging in the eastern province of Jiangsu. In response, authorities placed tens of millions of residents under strict lockdown and launched massive tracking and testing campaigns. By late August, health officials announced the outbreak had been effectively brought under control. Due to a lack of transparency under the regime, we cannot verify if the outbreak is actually resolved. But the surging cases do seem to challenge China's zero-tolerance virus policy. A typhoon is headed for China, clocking winds over 100 miles per hour at its center. Authorities along the nation's coastal regions are taking preemptive measures, and they've already issued the highest emergency response level in some areas. NTD's Don Ma has more. A super typhoon from the Philippines is tearing toward China. The country's eastern coastal cities are preparing for Typhoon Chansu to hit on Monday. Chansu was since downgraded from a super typhoon or Category 5 to a Category 3. But winds near its center are still roaring at a formidable 105 miles per hour. Residents of Shanghai, Zhejiang and other coastal areas have been warned to brace for strong winds and intense rains as the storm nears. Zhejiang's Meteorological Observatory forecast heavy rainfall for the province in the coming days, while local authorities have issued the highest possible emergency response level. Schools, flights, subways, trains and other transport services have been shut down in many cities there. Also in Zhejiang, authorities asked local fishing boats to return to port and take shelter. Online videos show flooding and landslides have already started. Along its path to China, Typhoon Chansu passed through Taiwan on Sunday. It drenched the island with heavy rain and blasted it with strong winds. Taiwan's central news agency reported more than 2,000 people were relocated from risk areas. Some airline flights and train services were suspended during the storm. Chansu originated from the Philippine Sea. It hit the northernmost region of the Philippines on Saturday, when it was still classified as a super typhoon. Packing maximum wind gusts of 174 miles per hour, it cut power and damaged houses. No casualties have been reported, but over 11,000 residents have been affected. One local called it one of the strongest typhoons he's ever experienced. Chansu is expected to head towards Japan and South Korea after plowing through China. Don Ma, NTD News. 
and Albert Einstein look-alike. Backflipping dogs and AI nurses were among the highlights at Beijing's World Robot Conference. But behind these displays, there are many controversies. Lisa Bernhardt has a report. The World Robot Conference kicked off in Beijing on Friday with backflipping dogs, an AI pianist, and what may be the brainiest robot yet, a Chinese-speaking Albert Einstein. The latest creations were largely focused on service, like a robotic dog made by Deep Robotics that can detect its own posture in real time to remain flexible and stable, the company's marketing manager said. Its biggest advantage is that it can replace humans to replace some tasks in complex and dangerous scenarios. For example, it can adapt to terrain such as stairs, slopes, gravel roads and grass. There's also what's referred to as a nursing robot, a mechanized wheelchair that can take someone to a bathtub or toilet and then back to bed, all on its own. Its founder sees China, with its large elderly population, as the biggest market for this type of AI. Most young people today are unwilling to engage in this job. Therefore, there is a huge gap in the workers who can take care of disabled elderly people. And this gap has brought great problems to the country and society. The World Robot Conference runs through Monday. China's AI players have been struggling in recent years as they deal with U.S. sanctions and other controversies. Since Time Group, China's most valuable artificial intelligence startup, was blacklisted by the U.S. in 2019. It's an export blacklist, barring the company from access to certain U.S. technologies. And two others, Magville and Yitu, were also placed in the same blacklist among 28 other Chinese tech companies. That's over allegations they support the state surveillance of Muslim Uyghurs in the northwestern Chinese province of Xinjiang. The U.S. also added CloudWalk to the blacklist last year. And the results? As China's industry and IT ministry says, many core AI technologies are still lacking and high-end supply is still insufficient. Disgruntled investors of China's second-largest property developer, Evergrande, are protesting, demanding their money back. Nearly 300 real estate companies reportedly filed for bankruptcy this year. If Evergrande joins the list, it could send shockwaves through China's economy. And it is Evelyn Lee reports. Chaotic scenes at the headquarters of China's Evergrande Group. Roughly 100 investors crowded the lobby on Monday, chanting, give us our money back. Evergrande, once China's biggest property developer, is also the world's most debt-saddled property developer, according to the New York Times. Now many investors and buyers are airing their frustration. We sold everything we had, both of those apartments, so that we could buy a property with Evergrande because of you. I expected tens of millions of yuan, but I haven't even received an invoice. This has been going on since May. Du Liang, the general manager of Evergrande's wealth management division, reportedly remained in the lobby overnight with protesters taking turns to air their grievances. The company has liabilities of more than $300 billion, an amount that is higher than Finland's GDP in 2020. This debt is partly a result of Evergrande's highly risky business model. It would borrow loans to buy land, then develop and sell homes at lower margins for fast turnover. Evergrande has been on life support for months, but this time Beijing is not stepping in. Chinese regulators want to fix the property sector's bad habit of borrowing too much. And with China's crackdown turning its focus onto the real estate market, nearly 300 real estate companies declared bankruptcy this year. That's according to Chinese news media The Time Weekly. Evergrande owes foreign investors more than $7 billion in bond payments for just next year. Now George Soros warns that an Evergrande default could cause China's economy to crash. Evelyn Lee, NTD News. Chinese fintech giant Alipay has a major restructure on the way. That's amid an ongoing business sector clampdown by the country's regulators. The Chinese technology company is a mobile and third-party payment platform, similar to U.S.-based PayPal. It now boasts over one billion annual active users. But Beijing wants to break it up. Alipay is owned by Chinese businessman and investor Jack Ma and his company Ant Group. That's an affiliate of Chinese e-shopping giant Alibaba. 
According to a Sunday report from Financial Times, Beijing is looking to create a separate app for Ant Group's lucrative loans business, separating it from the main platform. That's after Chinese authorities already ordered Ant Group to separate from its two main lending units in April. One called Huabei, which functions as a virtual credit card for Alipay users, and the other called Jiebei, a digital small loan service launched by the company in 2015. Two insiders tell Financial Times that Ant Group will also have to hand over its user data to a partially state-owned credit scoring company. Three sources likewise told Reuters that it's the first time state-backed firms have taken a large stake in Ant Group's credit scoring joint venture. TikTok is in the spotlight again, this time for promoting sex and drug videos to minors. That's according to a new report by the Wall Street Journal. And it's worth noting here that TikTok's parent company is based in Beijing. Let's hear from NTD's Phil Zhou for the details. The most downloaded app since 2020 is TikTok. It's currently number one on Apple's App Store entertainment section. It's ahead of Hulu, HBO Max, and even Netflix. But there's an issue. Minors aged 13 to 15 are being shown sex and drug videos endlessly. TikTok sort of feeds it up to you and learns what you're interested in based on the amount of time you spend on different videos. That's what happened to the Wall Street Journal. To investigate TikTok's algorithm, it set up dozens of fake accounts, only to start getting a tsunami of adult videos. Like, TikTok is the wild, wild west. Sam Sorbo is a kids' education influencer. She is the host of Schools Out on Epoch TV. I do think that TikTok is perhaps more dangerous than many of the other social media apps. One account registered as a 13-year-old was shown 600 videos on drug use, from cocaine to meth. Other accounts saw countless videos promoting sex shops and pornography sites. Social media might need to start having similar regulations to see what minors can and cannot see. TikTok says protecting minors is important. Users under 18 need parental consent to use the app, according to its terms of service. You know, they're using it as fun and games when there are people who are actively using TikTok to target your children. NTD News spoke to rising TikTok star Savannah Smiles. Her recent video got over 300,000 views. It's just a quick, fun way to entertain yourself. Um, I think it exposes you to a lot more different people. You get to see people on your Explore page that you wouldn't normally see, so it's really cool in that aspect. She has not been exposed to sex and drug videos, but says TikTokers should be cautious. It's the 21st century, and it's out there, so I think the best thing to do as parents is just to educate them on what's out there. Her mom, Donna, agrees. As a TikTok mom, I am concerned about our kids, but I think it starts at home. Like, we have to have those conversations with our children and ensure that they are equipped to make good choices. So what can happen to kids if they keep watching videos on sex and drugs? They can get physically hurt, certainly psychologically hurt, induced to um, practice all of these sex acts or to start using drugs or even there are some about um, uh, eating disorders to start doing all of the things that they think are cool because they see it on TikTok. TikTok says it removed 90 million videos in the second half of last year, but it's getting hard to keep up. Thousands of videos are getting uploaded every minute. Phil Zhou, NTD News, New York. Beijing's apparent attempts for economic and intellectual property theft on America aren't slowing down. Yet a group of Stanford University researchers is asking the U.S. Justice Department to ease clampdowns on Chinese espionage. Nearly 120 Stanford faculty members signed a letter urging the department to end a program that counters Chinese espionage and national security threats. The program is called the China Initiative. The Stanford letter was released Monday. The top reason it wants the initiative terminated? It claims that the China Initiative disproportionately targets researchers of Chinese origin. But the letter fails to bring up a 2017 Chinese law that states all Chinese citizens must cooperate with the Chinese regime's intelligence work. The Justice Department also states that 80 percent of all economic espionage in the U.S. has benefited the Chinese regime. So far this year, there have been at least a dozen confirmed cases of Chinese theft and espionage in the U.S. In one case from April, a Chinese national pleaded guilty to illegally exporting U.S. goods to a Chinese military university valued at $100,000. 
Now we look at an undiplomatic message from a senior Chinese diplomat. According to the National Review, China's new ambassador to the U.S. issued a rude comment during a private Zoom meeting, saying if we cannot resolve our differences, please shut up. The National Committee on U.S.-China Relations hosted the meeting late last month. The comment came after Evan Medeiros, a former Obama-era advisor, asked the ambassador how to improve U.S.-China relations. The ambassador first answered that Washington should stop worsening the situation. Then he uttered that undiplomatic line, which, according to the report, shocked meeting participants. The meeting included senior American-China experts, including former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and former Clinton and Obama staffer Jack Liu. After the meeting, the Chinese embassy posted a transcript of the ambassador's speech online. But the comments that followed were not included. In light of the 9-11 memorial ceremonies held over the weekend, Weeks spoke to a Chinese dissident and human rights activist who chose to demonstrate at Ground Zero. He says his goal was to draw attention to Beijing's ties to the Taliban. The Chinese Communist Party even invited the Taliban over to China. This July, Beijing invited Taliban leaders to meet with China's foreign minister Wang Yi. And last week, Beijing said it would send $30 million worth of aid to Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. As for activist Bai Jianmin, he's also hoping to shine a light on Beijing's human rights abuses, having endured them firsthand. He says authorities in Shanghai kept a close eye on him when he was in China. I was a businessman in China and often traveled abroad. Authorities thought I went abroad too often, and they were very sensitive to my activities because my wife works in the military. Bai's wife is a high-level officer in China's Air Force. He says authorities were concerned that Bai could get a hold of sensitive intelligence and bring it overseas. But their close watch cost him many business opportunities. While monitoring me, authorities also did background checks on all of my clients, and many of my clients were scared off and didn't dare to do business with me. Bai tried to seek compensation for the damages, but to no avail. He later fled China and became a human rights activist. But his activism came with a cost, divorce. My activism would have a negative impact on her career. The Chinese Communist Party gave her two options. Either you follow your husband or you follow the party. And of course, she would follow the party. It was impossible for her to side with me. She also made a very big decision. She would follow the party even though she had to give up both me and our family. He says he has limited influence as an individual, but he's calling for more support to expose the Chinese regime. A report by the UK's version of the Senate, the House of Lords, says the government adopts a policy of deliberate ambiguity to avoid making difficult decisions when it comes to China. It urges the government to put human rights before economic relations. NTD's Joan Robson brings us the details. A major report accuses the government of avoiding a clear strategy on China. Published by the House of Lords, the report looks at the UK and China's security and trade relationships in the past decade. It says the relationship has deteriorated because of the situation in Hong Kong and human rights abuses in Xinjiang, but the government has not set out a clear position on China. The report by a Tory-led committee notes inconsistencies, uncertainty and lack of a central strategy in the UK government's relationship with China. It includes views from former ministers and China experts. The report points to the need to show greater clarity and international leadership to ensure the balance does not tilt toward preserving economic relations at the cost of human rights. The Foreign Affairs Committee called for the government to publish a strategy on China by the end of last year, but the government did not do so. The report accuses the government of a policy of deliberate ambiguity to avoid making difficult decisions, and calls for a clear and consistent written strategy on China. Joanne Robson, NTD News. Taiwan's president is commissioning a new Navy warship. It's part of the island's plan to boost its defenses amid heightened tensions with Beijing. The ship is known as the Tajiang and nicknamed a carrier killer. Taiwanese company Longta Shipbuilding built the vessel. 
President Tsai Ing-wen spoke at a naval base in Seoul on the island's east coast Thursday. She explained that the stealth warship proves that Taiwan is on the path to becoming independent in national defense. The ship is designed to have air defense capabilities and can carry anti-ship missiles. It's the first of six of its kind that will be commissioned by the island's navy. Tsai has made boasting Taiwan's domestic defense industry a priority. That says China is one continuing to send fighter jets into the island's air defense zone almost on a daily basis, and two, using diplomatic threats to block military gear sales from other nations in recent years. China claims Taiwan as part of its national territory and has threatened to take control of it by force. Self-ruled Taiwan enjoys its own democratically elected leaders and constitution. Vietnam takes a precarious position with diplomacy in Asia. The nation hosted concurrent visits from both Japan and China, accepting China's vaccine offer with one hand and signing a defense transfer agreement with Japan with the other. Here's more. Vietnam hosted senior officials from both China and Japan over the weekend. First to get there was Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. He arrived in the country's capital, Hanoi, on Friday. And on Saturday, before leaving the city, Wang promised to send three million COVID-19 vaccine doses from China to Vietnam. The same day, Japan signed a defense transfer agreement with Vietnam. The deal allows Japan to send over equipment and technology amid growing concerns about Beijing's military influence in the Indo-Pacific. The Japanese defense minister described their partnership as reaching a new level. In a statement, he also emphasized the importance of ensuring freedom of navigation and overflight in the region, something both nations agree on. That's on top of coordination in other areas like cybersecurity. The new developments come after troubled past relations. China and Vietnam went to war over a border dispute in 1979, with both sides claiming victory. The Cambodian Prime Minister says Cambodia's relationship with China is ironclad. The statement comes after China gifted the country a new $160 million sports stadium. Construction was recently completed on the Morodok Taiko National Stadium. And on Sunday, China's foreign minister formally handed it over. During the ceremony, the Cambodian prime minister said he would always support the One China policy and said the friendship between the two countries is everlasting. The One China policy refers to Taiwan. Countries that abide by this policy agree with Beijing's territorial claim over Taiwan. Under a plan called the Belt and Road Initiative, China has been giving loans to developing countries for major infrastructure projects in exchange for influence. China has invested billions of dollars in Cambodia, and the two countries keep a close relationship. The United Nations rights chief on Monday showed regret that the organization could not get access to Xinjiang. They had wanted to probe reports of serious human rights violations against Muslim Uyghurs. I regret that I'm not able to report progress on my efforts to seek meaningful access to the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. At the opening of the Human Rights Council in Geneva, Bachelet said her office would soon release its assessment based on the information that is available. The United Nations has cited reports that one million Muslims held in re-education camps have been forced to work in Xinjiang. At first, Beijing denied the camps existed. Then they said they were vocational centers targeting extremism. In late 2019, China claimed that everyone in the camps had graduated. The second round of hearings for the Uyghur Tribunal in the UK came to a close on Monday. The tribunal is investigating whether China is conducting genocide or other crimes against Uyghurs, Kazakhs and other ethnic minorities in northwest China. Witnesses and experts gave evidence. The tribunal is a people's tribunal. It's not legally binding. But the hearings have angered Beijing, which is accusing it of lies and misinformation. The tribunal is chaired by Sir Jeffrey Nice, who led the prosecution of Slobodan Milosevic. And that's all for today's China in Focus. But before you go, we have a short announcement. If you're interested in a short weekly summary of what's really going on in China and some behind-the-scenes content of what we are up to, make sure you subscribe to our China in Focus newsletter. You can find the link to sign up in the description box down below. Every Friday morning, the latest will land in your inbox. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.